Hey, good morning, Saddleback. Please, please, please. Hey, uh, take your Bibles, if you would. Turn to the first book of your Bible, the last chapter of the... Uh, Last chapter of the first book of your Bible, so Genesis chapter 50 is where we're going to be. Uh, let me just start off by saying a couple things. First of all, hey, Saddleback, uh, thank you, all right, 42 years of amazing influence that God has allowed you all to have. You have set the pace for the big C church all over the country and all over the world, so thank you for that. Uh, you guys have walked by faith. God has used you in great ways, and the days ahead are going to be awesome as well. And also, I uh, want to just say uh, thank you for your pastor uh, I met Pastor Rick in 2014. He actually uh, preached for me at a pastor's conference in Baltimore, Maryland. And I did not know him personally up until that point, but uh, you can learn a lot about a man behind the scenes, all right? And you, you know, a lot of guys can come up on the platform and preach a good message, but uh, behind the scenes is where you see the heart of a person oftentimes. And uh, the way he loved on my family, just coming in in the green room and, you know, Pastor Rick is, I mean, just, just makes you feel right at home immediately, just hugged on my sons, you know, loved my family. And it was just, it was such a warm welcome. Um, and then secondly, uh, he went out and there were thousands of pastors there, uh, many of whom were going through a difficult time. And uh, I'd asked him to share a little bit about the journey he and Kay were on. This was about a year after Matthew's passing. And, um, you know, when uh, he just, he shared the pain and how God was sovereign and how God was good even through the pain. It's amazing the way God used his hurt and just the pain they were going through, but he used it to minister to thousands and thousands of pastors. And so just watching how, heart, how big his heart is, the generosity of his life. Um, and, you know, by the way, and today is, uh, you know, Matthew's birthday. So keep uh, he and Kay in your prayers, uh, particularly today. But uh, it, is a joy to, it is a joy to be here. And when I saw the series title about, you know, building a better future on relationships, I thought, man, I, I know what I need to share. I know what I need to learn. I know what I need to share. But building a better future. But the problem is, and I, and, and I don't know you personally, but I would say that I know in, uh, in, a, in a crowd this size, the, the, it's very hard to have hope that tomorrow can be different uh, than today, especially when it comes to family, because really there's no pain like family pain, Right. I mean, it's the one that hurts the most, it cuts the deepest, it lasts the longest is family pain. And sometimes it's so hard to think I can build a better future uh, without clearing a lot of the rubble that tends to accumulate in family life and the cycles we can all get stuck in, you know, the cycle of, of uh, neglect and then conflict and then conflict leads, oftentimes leads to withdrawal and then withdrawal just leads to that same cycle over and over and over again. It's like, all right, what can break the cycle? What can help my family, you know, turn the corner and build a better future? And without a doubt, without a doubt, uh, what we're going to see in the scriptures today helps jumpstart uh, what God wants to do in your family. But you got to take the garbage out first. I don't know about you, my my family, the where I live in uh, the East Coast in Asheville, North Carolina, trash day is Monday. And so I know Monday at, se at 7 a.m. or even before, man, that truck is going to come by. They're going to take all of our stuff we discarded and they're going to take it away. But a couple of months ago, my wife and I, we did some, you know, cleaning out the refrigerator, all that stuff, piled it in the canister. And it's like, man, don't forget to take the trash out. <laughs> That's not me telling her, okay? That's her telling me, don't forget to take the trash out. And lo and behold, you know, 7 a.m. comes, I hear the, I hear the, the trash truck uh, coming down there and I didn't get it out there in time. And so I had to wheel it back in, the walk of shame back into the garage. And uh, it sat there, no big deal for a couple of days, but after a few days, man, that garage started to stink, all right? It stink and then it got to be Wednesday and it, then it stank. I mean, it got, it just got worse and worse and worse. And what started in the garage as foul smelling after a few days in there, it started to seep into the house. And that refuse, that garbage we wanted to discard but didn't discard ended up affecting the entire house. And it was such a freeing thing that next Monday. I mean, that trash was out there at 6 a.m. It's like we are getting rid of this. And all that, all that to say, today is that day for you. Today is that day for you. And um, I'm not saying what we're going to look at today is nice. It's not, it's, it's, but it's necessary. And I'm not going to say it's fun, but it is amazingly freeing. Uh, when you and I see that, because uh, what we're talking about is an often misunderstood word. It's an often misunderstood concept, and I'm going to try to tackle some of those. But again, the, sometimes the conflict from the past is so right on the surface. Maybe even this morning, 
uh, driving to church, there's conflict and hurt and anger and tension and toxicity in the family. How do, what's going to make a better day for my family? Without a question, God's prescription for relational failure is, is what he calls forgiveness. All right, and so um, I know different people are going to probably come to mind during the next few minutes. It may be it's a... Uh, Maybe it's a spouse who is unfaithful, maybe it's an ex, maybe it's a parent who abandoned ship even you know, when you were a teenager. Maybe it's somebody who's not family but close, like a business partner or a friend. But, or maybe it is a brother or sister you hadn't talked to in months. And the idea is, okay, how do I get free from that today? All right, how do I begin the process of God, not just getting our relationships better, but how do I get to the place where God sets me free? So here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at a guy in the Old Testament. His name is Joseph. And Joseph actually is a focal point of a fourth of the book of Genesis. All right, It starts in chapter 37 when he's like 17 years of age, and it goes all the way to the chapter we're going to look at today. And so it covers a huge, a huge, a huge amount of material. But I want to just tell you, Joseph is not Superman. One of the things I tell my church all the time is there are no heroes in the Bible but one, all right? The rest of the people in the Bible, they're all villains except for Jesus. And when you think, oh, those families in the Bible, I wish our families could be like that family. No, you don't. I mean, when you look at the families in the Bible, they are much more Jerry Springer than they are my three sons, all right? You've got some messed up families in the Bible, and Joseph's is just like that. All right, Joseph had a messed up family. He had 12 brothers. He had one daughter from four different women. And not only that, the dad showed favoritism uh, to, uh, to Joseph. All right? He gave him the old, some of you all, uh, the, the coat of many colors. Now, I know we've got two groups today, and one of them, you guys are veterans. You know the Bible. You've read the Bible stories. You grew up in church. And for you, what I need you to do is you've got to make the conscious effort to take this story, take it off of the flannel graph, take it off of the kid's story, forget all the animated characters, forget all the, oh, the cute little coat of many colors. Forget that, all right? This is a real story with real people that has real relational pain in it. But those of you that are uh, maybe new to Bible study, I'm going to do a kind of a flyover, a little five or six minute cliff note version uh, before we sort of jump into, okay, how do I land this into my own life? How do I jumpstart this? And so here's, let me give you one verse uh, and then we'll give the context and then we'll jump and do a few more verses. But Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 says this, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all of the evil that we did to him. And so again, if you're new to Bible study, you say, what's going on in this family? Why would they think he would hate them? Why would they think that he was gonna pay them back? Why would they think vengeance is what's the first thing on his mind? Well, again, uh, they hated these 12 brothers. They hated him because the dad showed favoritism. That whole deal of that coat of many colors is like, okay, I like you the best. You're the one I like the best. Normally, that went to the firstborn. Instead, it went way down the line to Joseph. Jo You've heard of mama's boys. Joseph Wood is a daddy's boy. And because of that sin of favoritism, uh, the brothers hated him. One of those things about the coat of many colors, that wasn't just so he could walk into a place and have a lot of swag. That was basically a get out of jail free card when it came to manual labor. So he gets this coat, which gets him out of manual labor. So the brothers are out there working in the field. He's inside in the living room, sipping iced tea and playing PlayStation. That's what that meant. And they got upset about that. And they did some horrible things to Joseph. What they did to Joseph, if you read the entirety of the story, again, it's a long, it's a, fourth of the chat, it's a fourth of the book of Genesis. So here's what they did in a nutshell. They took Joseph. Joseph went out to check on them one time in the field. They hate him. They talk about it. They take him. They strip him. They take the coat off as well. They throw him in a cistern. They throw him in a pit. They don't even like that that's quite enough. And so what they do is they've got some slave traders. They start making their way by. They take him out of the pit, and they sell their brother into slavery. Now, don't miss that. The, pre, the people that were supposed to take care of him, the people that were supposed to have his back, the people that were supposed to love him the most, they sold him into slavery and they take him from Dothan where they were all the way over to Egypt. One of the things you see though in Joseph's life is over and over and over again with all the injustice, with all the hurt, with all the pain, with all the betrayal, you see a phrase repeated over and over and over again that God was with him, that God was with him and God was with him. So you progress through the story uh, Joseph ends up uh, being sold to a military leader. His name is Potiphar. He rises up because of his integrity. He rises up in Potiphar's family, so much so that he ends up getting a huge job. But in that case, you've got a, a person by the name of Mrs. Potiphar. All right, Mrs. Potiphar is, uh, 
how do we say that? She liked that uh, song, I like Hebrew boys and I do not lie. So that she, actually, she actually goes after, she goes after him. And because of his integrity, he's like, he runs away from the temptation and she ends up saying, you know what? He did this to me. And so Potiphar's like, I am throwing you in jail. And even in jail, God was with him. And while he's in jail, he's made some friends. They end up forgetting about him. But there's a point in time where the Pharaoh of that day, the most powerful person in the world of that day in that nation ends up saying, hey, I need a, a dream interpreted. And so he says, hey, I've heard about this guy. He can interpret dreams. He comes in. He says, here's what the dream means, Pharaoh. The dream means there's going to be seven years of fruitfulness, and then there'll be seven years of famine. And so he said, I like that. That's a great interpretation. And you are going to be the one in charge of giving all the food and, and God's sovereignty way back home in the promised land. His 12 brothers and their family, they are starving and they need food. So they move all the way back. They come up there and they, they don't know where he is. And they come up before him and there's like, hey, we need some food. And they don't even recognize him at first, probably because it's been 20 years, number one. And number two, it's because in Egypt, they put all this makeup on and all this costume on. They're like, I don't even recognize you. But a few chapters from what we're going about to, about to look at in detail is this, is he makes the decision to forgive them. He makes the decision, the choice. It's the same choice I'm going to challenge us to do, is say, I'm going to release them from the debt that they owe me. Some of you are like, I've done that before, and it doesn't work, or I thought about that, or that's not fair, and we're going to try to actually deal with some of those objections, the objections you have, the objections I have as well. But look at the rest of the passage here. Look at verse 16. It says, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. And we don't know if that's true or not, but this is them standing before the dad has died and they know now that it's Joseph. And here's what they're saying. They're saying, okay, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. Now, here's the idea real quick. I'm going to come back to this. Christians are very, very it's very easy for Christians to kind of discount the evil that was done to them. Some of you are like, I don't even want to deal with that today. So it's like, it's not a big deal and it doesn't affect me anymore. And listen, let me just say, when you say it doesn't affect me anymore, it doesn't affect me anymore. Please understand, loved one, listen to me. You're the only one that's close to you that actually thinks that. People that love you and are close to you. They know it does affect you because every time it comes up, every time she comes up, every time he comes up, every time that situation comes up, it's like, don't touch that. Don't, don't, don't touch that. And so they called it evil. Even they knew it was evil. And then it says, and now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Verse 18, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants, which by the way is a fulfillment of the prophecy that he said earlier. That's one of the reasons they hated him too. He said, hey, one day you guys are going to work for me. And uh, then all of a sudden, uh, that is exactly what's happening. So here's the idea. You, Joseph has three choices. You have three choices. There's not a person here that has not been injured in some way. And there's not a person in here that hadn't been injured by family, sometime intentionally, sometime unintentionally. Sometime they're enormous and huge, and sometime they're small. And please don't think that, uh, you know, flying yesterday morning all the way from the East Coast uh, over here, it's a lot of hours in the plane. Don't think that I didn't think about what could have walked in today in the sense of the pain and the injury and the anger and the bitterness and the baggage and the history that came in. So I'm not discounting anything. Just listen to me. But God wants to actually set you free. It's not about someone else as much as it's about you today. Because Joseph had three choices. Number one, he could be bitter and angry and vengeful. I mean, he could. He could have been so... Based, he could have. Um, he could have done that. Going back to this, like, it doesn't affect me. When I think of people saying, you know what, that injury doesn't affect me, that haven't really dealt with it at all. Uh, it's like that guy that plays basketball. You've seen him at the gym. You know, he used to be a great basketball player, used to be awesome. Maybe he was like even a pro, whatever. He was really good. But now he's not just older, but he's got banged up knees and maybe even a super injured knee. And you see him kind of dragging that knee around the basketball court. It's like, I can't. And you're like, hey, bro, what happened to your knee? What happened to your knee? He's like, what? That ain't nothing happened to my knee. Well, no, you're dragging it around. You're dragging around. It's like, forget that. It's not hurt. You're like, whatever. In the same way, you're like, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect me. Time, time healed the wound. Time heals nothing. Time does not heal all wounds. It actually makes it worse and festers. But one of the things that he has, he could be bitter. Or number two, he could have been vengeful. That's what they say that says, maybe he'll kill us. Maybe he'll pay us back. Now, can I just uh, be, <laughs> if I can be so transparent, part of that really resonates with us, correct? Okay, 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 okay. Part of that resonates with me, all right? So uh, some of you are like choleric type A, uh, 
eight on the Enneagram, whatever. All right, that's, that's just, I mean, that's who's trying to preach to you today. That is, I mean, I love Denzel Washington movies for the main reason that the bad guys always die. I mean, is that, that's the, because when something happens to you, there's a sense in which the scales of justice have gotten out of whack. There's a sense in which, you know what? That's not right. That's wrong what happened and they need to be paid back. And there's a part of you that at least, would there be at least part of you that wanted to kind of stick it to your brothers at that point? I mean, part of it's like, see, I told you, I told you, you would be serving me. And look at this, you're serving me. Boom, look at that. But he didn't do that. But that would have been fun, correct? I mean, there's a part that that's, that is very tempting. Or the, the healing part is he does, and you see the fruit of it here more than you do see the choice of it. Choice comes in about chapter 47, but the fruit of it is what we see here. He chooses to forgive the word forgiveness means to remove or to take away and make a little note for Bible geeks like me. You know, that's the first time this word is used in the Bible. First time it's used in the Bible, the actual word forgiveness, but it's used like 140 plus times in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it's usually like I cancel a debt. And that's really what forgiveness means. So let me, uh, forgiveness, if you're trying to think, what is he talking about forgive? It literally means to cancel a debt. Somebody injures you, they in a sense are then obligated to you, they owe you something. They owe you an apology, they owe you a marriage, they owe you purity, they owe you something, they owe you. And so forgiveness is, I'm releasing them from a debt that they owe me. So let's look at uh, verse 19, 20, and 21, and then let's, uh, let's see how we can put it into our lives. It says, Joseph said to them, do not fear. Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. He's not discounting what they did, okay? Joseph is not saying, oh, you know, that sibling rivalry deal, that's just kind of going around right now, and, you know, family dynamics, they're kind of strange, aren't they? That's not what he's saying. It's like, you know what, as for you, meant evil. You did. You meant wickedness toward me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. He's talking about how God in his sovereignty is using him to interpret the dream to feed all these people. Then he says, so do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So uh, what's it going to take for your family to take a step forward? What's it gonna to take to start to build back, a build for a better future? How do I clean off all the rubble that conflict and hurt and betrayal? And what is it gonna to take to clear off some of that rubble so I can build back for a better future? Just two principles today. Number one is in order for this to happen, you, gotta, you have to know grace yourself personally. Before you can ever do the horizontal business, you've gotta have the vertical business taken care of. You gotta be able to say, you know what, I know grace. He, Joseph knows he's a recipient of God's grace. Look what he says. He says, am I in the place of God? He's like, no, I'm not God. I'm just a man. I need forgiveness just like you guys need forgiveness. Now stay with me. Joseph knew that in all the injustice and all the betrayal, God was not just with him, but God had shown grace and graciousness toward him. And so here's what happens. People are going to hurt you. People are going to hurt you. People are going to hurt me. They're going to injure you, not just in your family, but above that. But here's what you have to do to some degree. If you're a son or daughter of Almighty God, through repentance and faith in Jesus, you've got to remember, big picture, people when they sin against you, that in our hurt, we must remember that no one has sinned, has been sinned against more than God himself. When you look theologically, when you look at the fact when Jesus dies on the cross, when he has the crown of thorns put on his head, when he is flogged and whipped and jeered and insulted and then put on the tree naked to stand before heaven and earth, that was our sin that put him there. That was our sin that put him there. And so when he raises up on those nail-pierced feet and says, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they do, He's like, you know what? He was sinned against more than anybody, and yet he's saying, listen, forgive the ones that put me here. And the reason that that's super important is because in the shadow of your own hurt, forgiving your enemy feels like a reward, like you are rewarding them. But in the shadow of the cross, it just feels like one recipient of grace giving grace to another needy sinner. And so for a lot of us, this is not about a person issue or a marriage issue or a parenting issue or a sibling issue. It's a gospel issue. Do I understand what the apostle Paul said when he said, listen, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Not was the foremost, but who I am currently the foremost. 
My good friend J.D. Greer back in North Carolina, he says, when it comes to relationships, I am first a sinner, and then secondly, I'm sinned against. I'm first a sinner. I got to just keep that in mind. First of all, I am a sinner. Secondly, then, I am sinned against. Just that alone would help about 50% of the marriages at church today. First, I am a sinner. Secondly, I am sinned against. And there has to be a conscious choice to say, you know what, that's going to be bigger than that. There's a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor back in World War II, and long story short, some of you might have read his book, Cost of Discipleship. And what he taught, what that whole thing is, is about the cost of being a follower of Jesus. But go back to World War II, and he was putting a seminary because you could see Hitler's war machine was just on the move, and he's like, and the church was start, the German evangelical church was starting to kind of acquiesce in a very, very bad way. He's like, we got to raise some disciples. And so Bonhoeffer starts a little seminary over in Germany. And it was costly, not money-wise, but commitment-wise. And so what happens is he's, it's a very demanding place, so much so that the folks back here in the West are like, hey, aren't you pushing them a little bit too hard? Preacher from the West goes over there to kind of check it out, see if everything's okay. And he takes him, Bonhoeffer takes him to a place like this where you can look out kind of in the mountains back there. But over there in the distance, you could see Hitler's war machine. You could see the planes taking off. You could see the soldiers marching in unison, all that kind of stuff, just building and building and building. And he makes that famous quote. He sits there and he talks about his seminary. And he's like, he said, this, this old seminary, this must be greater than that. This must be greater than that. And when it comes to family forgiveness, this, the understanding that first I am a sinner, secondly I am sinned against, I'm, this, I'm a sinner, must be greater than that I have been sinned against. And so uh, you're like, well, what, what are you asking me to do? Again, forgiveness is to cancel a debt that's owed to you. People owe you something. You need to understand that. And forgiveness is they don't owe me. I choose to forgive them. So Again, I've been doing this deal for a little while, so I know some objections, and I don't have to do objections by having preached on forgiveness a few times, because it's everywhere in the Bible. Not just God's forgiveness of you, but our forgiveness of other people who've injured us. Forgiven people forgive people. And so, but I can look in the mirror, because these are the objections that I have when I'm wronged, and I want to do the things, like I mentioned earlier, and just go man on fire on people. And I was like, okay, you know what? I need to, I need to look at these, and here are the objections. So let me try to answer a couple of ones that you might have today. Uh, number one. A forgiveness is not the denial of evil. It's not the denial of the sin. Again, Joseph didn't deny it. He calls it evil. Here, listen to me, loved one, and I say this. Uh, listen, I don't know you, but I do, I do love you, and God definitely loves you. But you have, to, you have to get in there and wrestle with this a little bit. The Bible says God hides your tears in a bottle. So there's not one tear you've shed. I know that... Uh, Seminary profs like to say, well, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a metaphor, Bruce, that God has a metaphorical, bo- whatever. You know, that's all I'm saying is it says God has a bottle that he sees every tear that I have. So don't, don't think that God doesn't know exactly what's going on in that heart. But you can't just deny something happened. That does no good at all to say, well, it's not a big deal. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not that big deal. But as long as you say that, it's an open wound. It just remains there. Secondly, it's not forgetting I've heard Christians say, I can't forgive until, until I can forget about it. Actually, the opposite is true. You will never forget until you actually forgive. Sometimes people feel like, well, God says he forgets our sin, so I can't forgive like that because I will never forget. Do you honestly think that Joseph forgot? Do you think Joseph's like, you know what I told, what did y'all do to me again? I can't remember. Did y'all strip me or beat me or throw me in a way? I can't remember which one it was. I can't remember, did I actually march behind a camel with handcuffs on all the way from Dothan all the way? I can't remember, could you somebody remember? It's not at all. Even when God says, listen, there are transgressions I remember no more. It's not like God has amnesia. It's saying that, you know what, through Christ and through what Christ has done on the cross, I'm not going to let your sin hinder the relationship anymore. That's what the whole phrase in Christ means. And so when you sit there and look at this, it's not, it's not like forgetting The gospel is that when you sin, Jesus sees you in Christ if you're an adopted son or daughter. And and again, there's another one. It's not waiting for an apology. Forgiveness is not waiting for an apology. It's not waiting for the knock on the door and say, you know what? I realize now what I did back then was wrong. Listen, Listen to them. They're not coming. They're not, they're not showing up at the door. 99% of the people who wrong you are not going to come back and say, 
Please forgive me. That was a terrible thing to do. They're not coming. As a matter of fact, if you're sitting there waiting for the doorbell to ring and for them to show up, if they ever by chance do, and you're just waiting for that, you are probably not in the posture to receive that anyway. Listen, they're they're not coming. The Bible actually teaches, and I know this is a little bit controversial, but only one place in the New Testament do you see where it says, you know, wait for them to come and apologize. And if you look at that one versus all the other calls for unilateral forgiveness, what you do see is you see that's probably talking about I'm going to communicate that I forgive you to that person. And so, again, waiting for an apology, that's just you're waiting for an apology. If you're waiting for an apology, you will die in your bitterness. You will die in your bitterness. That wound will continue to the rest of your days, just being an open wound. Every time somebody bumps it, every time you see them at the mall, every time a family reunion takes place, it's just like open warfare on that. You're like, well, what about, what about, what about you see, they're kind of reconciling here. Now, here's another one. Let me give you two more. Number, number, number next, whatever that is, is it is not, it's not uh, necessarily reconciliation. Okay, it's not necessarily reconciliation. Listen to me, because sometimes people have probably used that as like a guilt over you. The guilt is like, you know what? If you forgave me, if you forgave me, it would be back to normal. Yeah, I cheated on you with my secretary, uh, you know, three weeks ago, but I said I was sorry. Okay, listen to me. Listen, forgiveness is given, trust is earned. Forgiveness is given. It is. It's something that you give freely, trust, reconciliation, It takes one to forgive, but it takes two to reconcile. For reconciliation to take place, there's got to be some genuine repentance on the part of the offender, on the part of the offender. And so your business partner cheats you and you forgive them. And then three weeks later, it's like, hey, let's go back into business again. And not so fast, all right? Not so, I forgive you, I don't trust you. That's fine. Don't feel shame over that. And here's the one by far, the biggest one, the one that goes against a lot of things that just something is wrong in our system. And here's this, forgiveness is not, it is not a lack of consequences. Forgiveness, when you forgive somebody, you're not letting them off. If somebody does something wrong, somebody does something illegal, somebody commits a crime against you, call the police. Somebody needs to go to jail. You can call 911 and forgive somebody all at the same time. You can actually set up healthy boundaries so you don't put yourself at risk again. You don't have to say, you know, I get hypothetical situation, possibly hypothetical in my life, but I'm just saying, let's just say, for example, let's say your father-in-law, uh, let's say your father-in-law uh, gets drunk all the time at parties, and when you go to a party and he's drunk, he starts to verbally abuse you and say all this stuff, and, and, and you're like, the, the fourth time he calls, hey, come over for the New Year's Eve party. And you're like, you know what? Just, we're going to stay at home tonight or we're not going to do that. I thought you forgave me. It's like, listen, you can set up some healthy boundaries. You know what? Last time we went down that road, uh, this is what happened. The other time we went down, this is what happened. I love you. I forgive you. Uh, but we're just, we're not making the party tonight. Okay. Forgiveness is not giving the debit card to the teenager who maxed it out the previous week. All right. You don't have, you can forgive but it doesn't necessarily mean a lack of consequences. You're like, how do you even know that, Bruce? I mean, how do you know that? Uh, Let me do the cross of Jesus, the cross of Christ. Do you think the cross of Christ does not have consequences? It absolutely did. The cross of Jesus is where the justice and the wrath and the holiness of God meets the love of God. It's not either or, it is both and. Here's a verse you need to memorize, 1 John 4.10. 1 John 4.10 says this, in this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us, and listen to this, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You're like, what? Okay, listen, if you can say macchiato, you can say propitiation, all right? So, all right, okay. He sent it to, go ahead and say, one, two, three, say propitiation. One, two, three. Propitiation. That's all right. That's your $50 word for today. And what that means is this. Propitiation means, it's a great Bible word. Look at Romans 3, phenomenal Bible word. Propitiation means a payment that satisfies. A payment that satisfies. It means that when Jesus was hanging on a cross and he said, it is finished, guess what? It was finished. That was a payment that satisfies. And if you're in Christ and you've repented and embraced Christ, guess what? If God is satisfied with Jesus' payment and you're in Christ, then that means God is not dissatisfied with you. 
And so you're here and you're like, you know what? I've got to understand before I can ever show grace, I've got to know grace. What propitiation means is this. It means you are not your sin. You're not your divorce. You're not your abortion. All right. You're not what has been done to you. You're not what you have done. You are what Jesus has done and what Jesus calls you. And so what that means is this. What that means is this. Now this is going to be the person who offended you. Either Jesus is going to forgive their sin just like he has yours or they're going to pay for their sin in eternity. But to think that, man, there's no consequences, they're gonna get away with this. I mean, people, people don't get away with anything, not ultimately, not in eternity at all. And so, um, I gotta, I gotta, do you know that grace? Before we kinda go to that, okay, how am I gonna deal with this today? Do you know the grace? Do you know what it's like to say, you know what, somehow, some way, what Jesus did on the cross counted for me? counted for me. There's been a point where I said, I want you to be my boss. I don't want to be the boss of me anymore. I want you to be my boss. I want you to rescue me. If not, you can do that with your eyes open and your, your eyes open, your heads up and just say, you know what? I, I believe that what Jesus did on the cross counted for me. Would you adopt me into your family? Make me your daughter. All right. Make, make much of yourself through my life. All right. Just rep that's repentance. I'm turning this way and I'm turning that way. But if I know grace, then the the overflow of that, because there's a possibility you can know grace and then walk out of church and disgrace the very grace that you claim to have inherited. Because it says you need, to, you need to know it, but then he says you need to show it. You need to show grace. So Joseph, um, Joseph made his choice to forgive, but you see the fruit of it just blossoming here. It says, don't fear. In other words, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take you out, all right? He comforted them. It's the idea of empathized with. It's the idea of showed some sympathy. What'd they talk about? I don't know. I don't know what they tell you. you know, hey, if you're, not, if you're not sweating, you're not preaching, right? So um, is, uh, were they, I don't know what they talked about. Maybe they, maybe they had good old stories of dad. But also, did you see this the last one? It says he spoke kindly to them. One of the ways you know if you've actually forgiven somebody is the way you speak about that person. Jesus said this, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. One of the ways that God has convicted me is if I start speaking down on somebody, usually in the root of it is some anger over something that somebody actually did toward me, and so, or at least my perception of that. So Joseph, um, and here's a thought. Do you think Joseph had any idea of the consequences of his decision? And think about it. If Joseph had chosen to wipe them out, these 12 brothers ended up being the 12 tribes of Israel. From the 12 tribes of Israel comes Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Messiah said, go and make disciples of all the nations. Jesus the Messiah, he burst the church. The church explodes 2,000 years ago, and here we are in California. It's Saddleback Church that is a fruit of this. So you can trace it all the way back. What are the consequences of you making a decision like that today? We don't know. God only knows. At minimum, it's you being set free but think about it. Could it also be that family member you have been praying to be saved for years and years and years? God, please save my uncle. God, please save my brother. Please save my parents, whatever that is. And all of a sudden, you're, you've kind of nursed that hurt, and they see you extend grace. And then the light bulb goes on to say, you know what? If I can see grace given horizontally, and then maybe the light bulb goes on to say, now I can see the grace that God has shown me. So the consequences are big. The consequences are as big as the difference between a wound and a scar, because that's really what we're talking about. Whoever that person is, is it a prodigal? Is it a parent? Who is a business partner? Who is that? Some of you still have a wound. And you know what it is? I mean, a wound and a scar are similar and they're dissimilar. They're similar in this regard. They're similar as they all come from trauma. If you have an injury, if you have a wound or a scar, somewhere back in the time, you got hurt somewhere but they're so different as well. They're different because why? A wound is still open. A wound is not healed. A wound is sensitive. A wound, anytime anybody touches, like don't touch, ah, don't touch that. Which by the way, the writer of Hebrews says, do not let a root of bitterness spring up among you and thus defile many. You're like, why does this keep coming up in my new marriage and it's the same thing that came up in your old marriage or it's birthed from the old marriage and the injury that took place. And you're like, it doesn't affect us. It does affect you, loved one. It absolutely does. But a scar, a scar still has the trauma. It still happened back in the past, but a scar is healed. It's visible. You can see it. That has happened, but it's healed. Think of it this way. A scar is a testimony of healing. Some of you have got a scar, and it is a testimony to God's grace. You know what? God healed that wound. God healed that wound. You're like, I'd like to get in on some of that. 
Well, how are we going to do that? Let me give you three simple progressive steps. Number one, you got to name the person. Now, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and give testimony. I'm just saying in your mind right now, go ahead and let, I know you're like, I don't like to bring that person up. Exactly. You can't forgive who you can't identify. Who is the person? Name the person in your mind. Go ahead and go there. Who is the person? You're like, oh, well, yeah, it's like nobody. I don't really have. Okay, let me ask it a different way. Who is in debt to you? Who's in debt to you? Or, here's one. Who do you, uh, who do you have imaginary conversations with? Man, I wish, that, I wish I'd have thought of that when they said this. That would have been awesome. Zinger, you know, who's that? Okay. Here's one. Who would you like? Who would you put? Come on, honest. It's church, all right? Who, who would you pay back if you knew you could pay them back and get away with it? That's the person I'm talking about. Name the person. Who is the person there? Father who walked out on you when you were little. What is it? What are they? He owes you, you know, a lifetime of memories. He owes you the fact that he was at least to some degree supposed to show you at least a tiny bit of the character of your heavenly father. Maybe it is a spouse who betrayed you. You've been married 10, 15 years. You raised a family. You're about to enter into that golden era called the empty nest. And you're like, this could be amazing. And then all of a sudden he's got a midlife crisis and is that guy and he, you know, shirt down to here, hair coming out of his chest, driving a convertible. All he's like, he's that guy. And he did that and he went there and it's like it shattered everything. Maybe it is the son or daughter who you spent a lifetime trying to raise and you raised them in the church and they've just kind of flat out left. Maybe it's the person, maybe it's the kid you poured your life into them and you took them to every soccer game and now you're lucky if you get a call on Mother's Day. Determine what they owe you. Number one, identify, determine what they owe you. Now you think this is kind of a silly step, but you, what we do is if we don't identify what they owe you, then we tend to forgive generally and not specifically. So what do they owe you? Here's some possibilities. What they take from you. Okay, what do they need to return in order to make things the way they used to be? Is it an apology? Is it money, time, a marriage, a family, a reputation, an opportunity, a chapter of your life? I mean, again, be specific. Be specific. Like, this is what they owe me. This is the obligation. But let me, also, let me say this. A lot of times, they can't even pay it back. How are they going to pay back your reputation, bro? How are they going to do that? Half the time, the people like this, they've already passed away. They're dead. How are they going to do that? You can sit there and nurse it and nurse it and nurse it and nurse it and die a bitter, angry Christian. Listen, I've seen a ton of bitter, angry preachers. We don't need any more bitter, angry Christians. But here's the, here's the last one, is you've got to cancel the death. It's a big deal, but don't make it a bigger deal than it needs to be. It's a decision. Like, I don't, I don't feel like doing that this morning. I mean, you some dude flew out here on a plane from the wrong coast, and we don't, really, we don't really care. Listen, it doesn't matter what your feelings are. It doesn't matter. You think Joseph, I mean, you see emotion. He wept. I'm not saying it's not emotional. I'm saying your feelings can't lead you in the decision. If your whole Christian life is, I'm going to do it when I feel like doing it, I mean, it's just a roller coaster. That's all it is, just up and down, up and down, up and down. And here's another truth, a gospel-infused fact put into your, will at some point change the feelings. What I'm asking you to do is just do what God tells us to do and what a lot of times we've prayed would happen. Remember when they asked Jesus, hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray, Jesus. We like to know how to pray because we like it when you pray. When you pray, stuff happens. And so he teaches us the Lord's Prayer. And we know that. We know that prayer. Now I'll lay me down. It's really, that's not the Lord's Prayer, okay? But they, remember the part of the prayer. Our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We, we like all that part, but remember the one part? Gets there around verse 12 and kind of circles back to it around 13, 14, 15. Remember what he says? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Is that not scary? Because what he's saying is, listen, I'm praying the prayer the grace you show me would be the same level as I show other people. I don't, I don't think we want that. So who is it? Here's a simple thing I'm going to ask you to do. Just If you can look on the screen and you can see the little fill in the blank thing, I want you to fill those blanks in. I mean, who is it? Just make the decision. Like, how do I do that? Here's the way. Just tell the Lord. Just say, you know what? 
Bob, Susie, Gertrude, whatever. He, they have taken, they have taken this from me. They took my, you put it, fill in the blank. I choose to cancel this debt just as you forgave me. I forgive and say it. So go ahead, bow your heads and close your eyes if you would, and just do a little, make that place a little altar, your chair a little altar, and just say, uh, just go ahead, bow your heads. Go ahead, it's going to be all right. Don't be afraid. Nobody's going to have a quiz after this. This is the time. This is why. This is a big reason of what God brought you to church today. Such a phenomenal worship. Well, the last song was what? I, I need you. I need you. So that's a great way to start this off. God, I need you. I don't want to do this, but I need you to, I need you to help me do this. Identify what's owed to you. Make the choice right now in church. You don't have to do this later on, just right now. You don't even feel like, God, I, this is what they owe me. I forgive for Father, you're a gracious, gracious, gracious Father. Thank you for the prescription for relational failure. God, my prayer for my brothers and sisters that are here today is that this would turn the corner for them and for their family and for their close relationships. God, I pray as people go into the parking lot and that there would be a, the chains for many people will have just fallen off. God, thanks for the grace you've shown toward us. God, thanks for forgiveness. Help us to walk out and look a little bit more like you and being forgivers. In Jesus' name, amen.